on on behalf of the Urban Institute, uh, I'd like to welcome you all to another in a series of dialogues that we are having with uh, people that have been quite uh, influential to our new body of work. Um, and tonight I'm well tonight, yeah. I mean, this it's midnight where I am, so it's already Friday. It's it's already Friday morning. Um, I'm I'm particularly pleased to welcome Luciana Parisi, whose work has been an enormous influence on on mine. Um, and so I'm really uh, honored and glad that uh, Luciana, you're here to. Uh, share some of your your more recent uh, ideas and uh, this will be responded to by Ored Halpern and Romy Ron Morrison. So Luigi Parisi, Luciana Parisi is a professor at the program in literature and computational media art and culture at Duke University. She was a member of the Cybernetic Culture Research Unit and currently a co-founding member of the Critical Computation Bureau. Her research is a philosophical investigation of technology and culture, aesthetics and politics. She is the author of Abstract Sex, Philosophy, Biotechnology and the Mutations of Desire in 2004 and Contagious Architecture, Computation, Aesthetics in Space, uh, 2013. At the moment, she's completing a book on alien epistemologies and the transformation of logical thinking in computation. And then for our respondents, we have Orit Halpern, who's a lighthouse professor and the chair of digital cultures at the Technische Universität Dresden. Her most recent book with Robert Mitchell, uh, 2023, is titled The Smartness Mandate. It examines how we have come to believe that digital computing is essential to human survival and how smart technologies and ideologies are remaking planetary futures. She's also the director of the Against Catastrophe, a lab bridging the arts, environmental sciences, media, and the social sciences to envision non-catastrophic futures. And she's currently writing a book on extreme infrastructures and the history of experimentation at planetary scales in design, science, and engineering. And then Romy Ron Morrison is an interdisciplinary artist, research, and educator. Their work investigates the personal, political, ideological, and spatial boundaries of race, ethics, and social infrastructure within digital technologies. Using maps, data, sound, performance, and video, their installations center Black diasporic technologies that challenge the demands of an increasing quantified world, reducing land into property, people into digits, and knowledge into data. And Romy has exhibited work and given talks at numerous exhibitions, conferences, and workshops around the world, including Transmedia All, the Alt CPS Biennality in Copenhagen, the American Institutes of Architects in New York, the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, House of the Kultur und der Welt in Berlin, Queens Museum, and the Walker Museum of Art. They have been residents at IBEAM Center for Art Plus Technology at NYU, the Joan Mitchell Foundation, and Femtech Next. Their writing has appeared in publications by MIT Press, University of California Press, Catalyst, Feminism Theory, Technoscience, and Logic Magazine. And they have taught courses at Parsons School of Design in New York and the University of California, Southern California. Romy is presently an assistant professor in the Design Media Arts Program at UCLA in Los Angeles. Okay, so Luciana, the floor is yours for for whatever. Okay, uh, thank and you. We will have uh, some 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 respondents. So welcome, Luciana. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Malik, for inviting me to be part of this conversation, this long term project that you have. It's uh, 
I'm flattered and enthusiast about how it's going to then weave together and um, in your institute. Um, so that's uh, thank you to uh, Rami uh, for your time and uh, Orit as well for your availability time to, you know, reaccommodate my time. So I'm really grateful for that. Uh, I um, am familiar with audit work for a long time, and um, I'm happy to have encountered Rami. Your work is um, extremely interesting. I was reading it with other folks here, so I'm very um, glad that we can have this conversation today. So I guess um, I'm just going to say a little bit about um, some of the uh, intervention. I think my work has been moving or some of the fields in which my work has been moving in the last, uh, I don't know, maybe seven, eight years, um, where um, all started with this question of critique, right? What is critique uh, in relation to computation or technology? How do you do critique without just falling into a paradox of, um, you know, uh, kind of living within this kind of new asset of um, or configurations of power where, you know, we, we all have called the control through cybernetics, through the work of Deleuze and Gattari, uh, the work of, uh, um, you know, post-Kantian, post, post even Foucauldian mode of understanding, variability, probability, differentiation, um, and this kind of uh, rampant model of um, techno-capital uh, and accelerationist capital, of including uh, variation and difference. So how do you how do you do critique without being complacent to the critical or to the kind of um, a mode of power that uh, and the infrastructure of control uh, uh, that is the dominant uh, model? Um, so so the question of critique then it became a question of for me um, given that I'm always been interested in technology as. Um, um what one mode of entering uh, uh you know critique and especially in the aftermath of uh, the influence of cybernetics uh, and computation in the shaping of our everyday and also the capacity of science and techno science to provide us some future provide the, Im the imagery of, of the future or, or the scenario or um, you know where 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 we are heading, um, and and capturing that scenario, capturing the imagination in the same way as capturing difference or articulation of difference or uh, variability or um, even the the let's say the indeterminacy. So indeterminacy also uh, or, or the unknown is also are also become have become probes and. Uh, um, um, part of the, the articulation of, of, of power insofar as uh, the betting on the unknown or the kind of extraction of the unknown um, one could argue it's always been core uh, to, to forms of capitalism um, especially if we uh, one goes not only to look at uh, the work um, of uh, you know the for instance the Italian autonomia uh, where you know the social becomes productive of uh, of value, but especially the work developed uh, by um, within the ra black radical tradition uh, and uh, black feminist work about uh, the extraction of value of blackness, the extraction of value of, of difference. So there is all all this was kind of you know um, uh, melting in the pot. And and so my my focus on on uh, on technology or let's say forms of, of technology that um, are pervasive, such as you know as we all know, um, you know forms of automated decision making system, by which I mean um, forms of AI as artificial intelligence is being developed since the eighties or the shift from uh, a hard problem in AI where AI was. Um, you know, a part of this kind of uh, articulation of a cognitive or automatic cognition that uh, was based on symbolic reason to a form of uh, automation and um, artificial automated system. They instead were relying on interaction. So the idea of interaction of, you know, kind of um, uh, bringing within the system 
let's say the contingent or let's say the the, the way the user or the way the social becomes this kind of uh, uh, experimental zone for which the system can learn to adapt, to create new probability, to market new existence uh, and, and to extract new forms of capital, affect, desire um, and sociality. So, so, so these were the, these two problems that I had and, and I, I thought what, one way uh, for me to go through uh, this question is rather than looking at the bigger picture of uh, the social, political, economic uh, uh, infrastructure that determines forms of racialization or, or discrimination, uh, sexual gender discrimination, I want to go and look at the medium. So the medium for me has always been important and I think um, this is something that I learned in, the, you know, back in the days when I was working with the CCRU, but actually also the the, the, the influence of some of um, German scholarship uh, together with the uh, American studies of, um, uh, let's say, of studies with, developed in America from people like Catherine Hale, so um, the, the, the cybernetic... Uh, um, uh, lectures of the 80s, of, of the 70s, Gregory Bateson, where, you know, the, the idea of the medium uh, uh, or the work of Gilbert Simondon, that's another person, another massive reference for me, uh, where the medium is less um, just a means to uh, actually program for specific ends, but the medium uh, becomes um something where that uh, already is a code, the cultural, political, uh, aesthetic code. So and so the, the medium in a way is uh, already bringing within itself a form of epistemology. And that's what I'm, I'm interested in, cracking the epistemology of the medium. Now, we know that um, there's been so many discussion about um, the medium uh, as uh, already um, enfolding biases. So for instance, and, and there's been a quest for uh, unpacking the biases of the medium. Now we have seen this a lot with social media uh, and with this kind of large corporate uh, models of so lang large language model that kind of have reproduced forms of uh, um, you know, um, dominant uh, discriminatory knowledge and there has been a, a quest for opening up uh, the medium to transparency or you know to actually if 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 the medium contains these forms of epistemology then one way to go about it is to open up it to expose to reveal as it were uh, the 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 biases of the media or the uh, or the epistem or the epistemology uh, the 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 dominant epistemology of the media that are falling to dominant modern uh, problem of um, the pillars of patriarchy, racial capitalism, uh, and um, um, uh, and other forms of discrimination. So, in a way, um, that's been one discourse. And there's been a lot written about, you know, these new forms of technological surveillance or the extraction of, uh, uh, of the new forms of surrogacy uh, um, that uh, have been set in place by uh, these systems of automated system of control of reason and decision making. And I found that uh, this was this, this so in a way that is, like, is an example of how we see critique, right? Critique is or is is uh, the method of critique is to reveal the the biases of 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 technology, um, and this is um, also something that, for instance, the late work of uh, Bernard Stiegler has also developed by um, you know talking about the new age of brutalism, the way that. Um, the imperative of as if the imperative of the epi dominant epistemological structure was conveyed straight away by this medium. So the medium just becomes in both these kind of forms, the medium is, is understood as just a, a vessel, an empty vessel, a kind of it's almost like a body without soul that um uh transmit directly almost without mediacy, without, you know, it's like almost, a, it's a form of critique that takes away the capacity of the medium to mediate and just 
uh, points the, the fact that the medium immediately uh, without any uh, kind of negotiation or without any kind of mediation transmits or conveys or, or reproduces the dominant uh, epistemology. Um, and so for me, this was a, a problem. This is, is a problem because he actually, instead of actually um, questioning what is the medium after critique of how can the medium uh, provides uh, or challenge forms of critique based on this revealing, unveiling, reproducing. Actually, re it actually, it kind of sets up exactly the uh, the premises that is trying to escape. So there is some kind of circularity in this form of critique because um, uh, the critique dismisses exactly the very medium, the very instrument, the very uh, what I called, um, you know, model, servo mechanic model or technology, and actually makes makes the medium do exactly uh, the, this form of uh, carries exactly this form of servo mechanic uh, uh, model. So, how do you break from the servo mechanic model of technology? What what do you do? How how do you uh, avoid this kind of reproduction of the scene? Of uh, um, you know um, of oppression or, br or, or brutal oppression, um, and um, so one one way to do that uh, I have been arguing and also in other work together with um, Ezekiel Dixon Roman and the CCB um, and uh, in some dialogues that we developed during this uh, um, kind of uh, six weeks. Uh, uh, no, two weeks work on recursive colonialism, um, a series of conversation talks that we developed during pandemic was um, was actually to um, understand the kind of entanglement of technology with um, racial capitalism. So that's one thing in which and how we can uh, one one way in which we have uh, um, um, break open the code of the of the tool not at the level of what is supposed to do but on the level of um of its own conception it's almost like something that the medium the conception in the medium is without ontology it's just procedure it's supposed to be an instrument to um for for other ends um is um um called is just determined in terms of functions mechanic operations so in a way it contains all the kind of uh, um uh, kind of a model of articulation of what is not thought what is not philosophy what is not being so always sides on the on the negative um on the ne on the negative standpoint insofar as the medium is negated existence is also a negative of the of existence uh or or of thought or of culture um and so so that is something that um, has allowed us to uh open up the medium to these other dimensions so instead of using me the medium say oh the medium hides um the pillars of um uh racial capitalism, patriarchy, this kind of, and, you know, um, which underline the dominant model of transcendental philosophy, which is something I can talk about in a, in a, little, in a little bit. Um, I, we really wanted to go flat with the medium. So just crack open the medium really means crack open the medium. How the medium has been philosophically conceived and how instead they can, um, what are the possibility of conceiving it uh, otherwise? So, some of my work is done to uh, Francois Laduel, who wrote this article um, called The Transcendental Computer, where he shows this kind of the, the game, the game of philosophy to say that um, machines, uh, even machine intelligence, can never acquire reason because it's just a mode of a quantified intelligence, a quantified intelligence that can be reproduced and set up to work anytime, every time. And the forces are unable to be autonomous. So it shows the kind of game in which philosophy sets up AI as its kind of opposite in order to restate the authority of philosophy, which is the fact that if machines can make automated decisions, that automated decision has it 
we see in the critique of AI. It's just tasks. It's just more uh, capacity to compress data. It's just um, uh, a kind of uh, capacity of machines to uh, reproduce, to optimize. You know, so always within this this logic of. Uh, uh, of the medium as a servo mechanic uh, tool of philosophy. So Laruelle has allowed me to open up this uh, uh, question of technology uh, um, to reveal in a way, but also not just revealing as a kind of um, what is the truth of technology behind technology, but actually to uh, generate also a, another understanding of the instrument that is not just a means to an end, but a mean that elaborates its own end. So, and when you go to cybernetic, read cybernetic through I don't know, the work of Yokoi, um, uh, Simon Don, you, you know, it, they have developed a model of mechanology or a model of cybernetics that is uh, uh, based on this notion of recursivity and the, the function of recursivity as opposed to some kind of mechanic model of technology that just breaks the whole in two parts and reproduces it. But rather, this form of recursivity that, um, comes from second-order autopoiesis, where the, the, the idea is that the system is able to self-reproduce itself uh, self-organize and change structure in, the, in, in time and space. So, for instance, Yukui makes this in recursivity a contingency, makes an effort to actually talk about a metaphysics of cybernetics that is not mechanicistic. Uh, he also diffuses vitalism, something that we can talk about later, but in, he offers us this this kind of almost a natural philosophy of, of technology. And so which is on one end interesting, but also problematic. And the, the natural uh, kind of philosophy of technology almost brings back the idea that technology is not an invention of modern uh, capitalism, but techne as a form of know-how uh, is actually... Um, uh, uh, is actually being um, constitutive of systems of knowledge. Your system of knowledge don't start with the epistem, don't start with this kind of already constituted paradigm, but actually come from practices, right? Tech, so it's almost like know-how, practices, uh, and, and the kind of uh, intermingling of practices that, for instance, Simon Don shows are central to the constitution of any technology. So it's always an ensemble. It always goes to a process of individuation in time. Um, it always is also ontogenetic. I, it produces something that is different from it from itself. Um, and, and so it just opens up this idea of technology to a techno-social form, as opposed to just technology as a means to an end that is uh, a tool that is um, just uh, uh, devised in the image of men, let's say. So that's uh, that's something that Yui um, uh, Yukui, I think, is very useful and important to open up uh, this question that technology is always techno-social systems. We're not talking about just tools. Uh, and then, um, on the other hand, another uh, important influence for me is the work of Sylvia Winter. Uh, Sylvia Winter was at Stanford during uh, the period in which uh, um, the, the, the work of Gregory Bateson, especially what he calls recursive epistemology, was very important. And she picks up on that. And in her description of uh, thinking about uh, epistemological models of, of of knowledge that reproduce over time. Um, she takes up this idea of recursive epistemology from Bateson, whereby um, uh, the, the epistemology is not just this kind of sets of paradigms, but actually is uh, has to do with the uh, capacity or know how to congeal and consolidate uh, forms of knowledges that actually whose function is to reproduce themselves. Because she's trying to explain how is it that domi domination stays domination. She calls it, how is it that cosm um, 
dominant cosmogonies, which are you know stories about the origin uh, of of uh, of man, origin of culture, origin of society, origin of the human, perpetuates over time. That's what she's trying to ask uh, to 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 address. So Bateson provides this kind of um, model of temporality uh, that is systemically uh, um, and dynamically um, uh, persistent over time. So it's not just so that's that's a very interesting way in which uh, um, knowledge uh, is uh, um, uh, and the kind of um, models in which. Uh, 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 she talks about these two things about the how ontology or the question of being or the question of where we are from can never be addressed directly. But what needs to be addressed is actually uh, the explanation and the statement, the descriptions that maintain this kind of mythos or mythopoetic, this narration, uh, this language, uh, this wording. Um, which uh, uh, reproduce themselves uh, eh, that justify being. So in order to create to, for a critique of epistemology must start with epistemology as opposed to um, log into a question of being. The question of being almost, which is you know, in, also interestingly, very different from what Heidegger, for instance, was posing in the question of technology, because he's posing a question of being, right? It's only by understanding the, uh, the ontological condition of our epoch, i.e. being, that we can actually withdraw and sub subtract, uh, critique can, we can withdraw and subtract from the domination of capital where everything is sellable, exchangeable, fungible, and so on. Um, and where philosophy has no mean has no meaning except being just a mean, right? But but actually, uh, um, winter just shifts completely into this. We need to understand the the the, the recursive reproduction of knowledge. So how how do you do that? So for for us, the you know the fact that cybernetics um, and computational logic. Um, rely on the recursive function, which is an iterative function of uh, algorithm in kind of compressing data and reproducing data over time, you know, became this kind of uh, overlap, allowed that to overlap the possibility of a techno epistemology where the principle of recursivity um, is as important in the social reproduction of knowledge as the techno social reproduction of knowledge. So, um, so that has led us, at least me, my own work, to open up the question of instrumentality, um, relooking into uh, the critique of instrumentality of the Frankfurt School, especially uh, Horkheimer, uh, and uh, the work of pragmatists like uh, such as John Dewey, who has a different understanding of of means uh, and and um, and. And actually, so this this kind of um, possibility of articulating um, uh, the recursive function of this automated system, which are always techno-social, and how this recursive function kind of breaks from the idea of the tool as a servo-mechanic uh, uh, function um, is where I'm at. Is where I'm at and where I'm trying to uh, develop this kind of... Uh, um, forms of uh, uh, of automation like uh, that are not just um uh, they cannot just be criticized by just looking at the epistemology that they actually are reproducing but also at the epistemology that they are generating uh which doesn't mean that they are um, so that's that, can, that can be I just want to clarify this and then we can move on so of course we've been talking about how a generative uh, uh, epistemology uh, can, you know, return to the kind of um, model of um, representation uh, of what is to be human, mode of inclusion of what is to be human, you know, the kind of becoming human technology, the anthropomorphization of the other, the, the kind of 
capturing of the indeterminacy to uh, preempt uh, the possibility of difference. Um, uh, we have talked about this 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 uh, problematic question of gener of, ge of the generative. Uh, on the other hand, however, I think that this has um, overlooked um, the this function of um, or recursivity of actually not just autopoietically reproducing all of its structure, but actually um, of breaking its structure because it, in its kind of ar articulation with the contingency and with the determinacy, um, there is always the possibility of, uh, you know, the, the parallax views, almost like the, the, the view from the negative that maintains um, something that I call negative machines in one of these papers that I recently wrote, that maintains this kind of refusal of wanting to be incorporated into the project of becoming human or into the transhuman project of becoming um, uh, overhuman or superhuman or more than human. Um, so, and, and it's interesting to, uh, you know, to bring um, forward this invitation uh, to uh, to me uh, because uh, I'm working on another project on technology and abolition in in, in kind of twisting and 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 um, articulating uh, um, forms of negative refusal uh, of from being and the kind of foreclosure from being that uh, um, forms of uh, indeterminacy bring within the systems. So, which is not just to say they are glitches or failures or noise or chaos, but they are, uh, to me, uh, semantically useful. And last, or semantically, um, um, not useful, but semantically real. And one thing that we, we can probably, one example I have is to, you know, we all, to, you know, it's very um, common today to talk about ChatGPT, but we know that uh, ChatGPT and this large language model have been around for a long time. And since the, you know, the 80s and uh, the development of deep uh, learning uh, machines, obviously, uh, has been a way in which the uh, these automated systems have demonstrated that they are uh, generated a completely hallucinatory, uh, what we call an hallucinatory, hallucinatory reality. And one can wonder whether this kind of capacity of this large language model of um, um, being unable to compress all, all these huge, um, you know, uh, in, in entropic forms of in information that this come from, um, whether they are actually also speaking something else and what are they speaking, given that, you know, they are not just agent, but they are social technical infrastructure. So um, I'm interested in teasing out, in twisting, in uh, um, fabulating uh, forms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, machine speaking that um, challenge and break from the cybermechanic model of cybernetics. So that's um, that's me. I don't know if I've talked too much, probably. But these are some of these kind of uh, ideas that um, I'm open to yeah, discuss. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Luciana, for such a, a lucid uh, review of what your mind has been up to for the last decade. Um, really appreciated that. Um, Aura, do you want to do you want to to have the floor? Thanks. <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll in, intrepidly walk in. Um, so thanks, Luciana. I I'm sort of blown away. So I don't know how cogent or um, direct this is. I'm not going to actually have that much to say. But first, I want to just thank you. One of the things I love about Luciana's work is the way. Um, you both insist on this sort of um, inhumanity and contingency of the machine. And that's something I've been trying to think about. Um, and I guess that's something I'd like to talk about because um, one of the things, and also, so one of the things that preoccupies me, although on a really different register, and I 
And I often am trying to understand, even at a scalar or maybe embodied and empirical way, like how can we link together these approaches? Because, you know, um, coming more from anthropology says, you know, not to stick us in, in groups, but I'm assuming a lot of people here in urban planning and design, you know, we kind of um, have certain approaches. And so it's really, for me, it's always been a challenge and that particularly a challenge your work has, has leveled to me to both question how much, how, how well I understand or, or my own assumptions about the machine systems that manage or control the infrastructures I study, say in smart cities or um, more broadly, the epistemology of smartness, what my assumptions are. And then secondly, I'm always concerned with what stays the same and what changes in the field of history. So um, one of the things that's kind of preoccupying, but also is a political and ethical challenge in our present is trying to understand sort of how certain colonial formations have continued, but also what's happening, like is contemporary forms of neocolonialism or extractionism, are these um, emerging systems um, creating new forms of violence? And what are they? And how do we understand the relationship both without ignoring the past, but simultaneously recognizing that if we keep saying it's just colonialism again and again, that also assumes that nothing's ever changed. And in many ways uh, is a backdoor to um, creating new ontologies that are stable of race, sex, gender, class, and stuff like that. And I was particularly, uh, Rami, thanks for, uh, I, I wasn't familiar with your work, but I really, so I thought one thing that would be an interesting conversation would actually be, I was looking at your work on the future conditional, um, on questions of um, how one uh, both recognizes a future that hasn't yet happened, but still needs to through different sound and, and I guess, and, um, and, and textile and, and, and material practices, but also in general through your work, there seems to be this question of a future that has never arrived and has never happened, but one that we still wish to imagine. And I guess I wanted a little bit of a conversation between maybe between these two bodies of work, actually, um, Rami, yours and Luciana's in terms of how, where the imagine, questions of imagination sit in your kind of recursive philosophical construction, um, as well as, the tension in your own work, I just want to hear more about it because I like I, I'm I'm like so in love with both sides of your argument, you know, which is both the fact that there seems to be something imminent and particular and emergent about these new technological for mediums and the forms of I don't want to like return to like but to the forms of thought they engender, staying away from questions of intelligence and reason while at the same time you're so um, pressing on the question of the fact that AI and philosophy reify themselves in the maintenance of essentially an 18th century um, tradition of the Enlightenment. Uh, and so I'm kind of interested in just like talking together about how we think these things together and how we pressure, how we both allow this critique because it's so important, but at the same time, uh, safeguard or, or try to produce practices that also do not themselves become determinist where like the past always ordains the future like it's always been colonial now it'll be more colonial D do you know what I'm saying like that we don't want to over determine that that is as you know as a historian of science you know we know or we we have for a long time it's been about showing that you know race sex, these things are not biologically determined. They're not facts in the world. They're contingent, contested, and situated, and constantly changing, and that we need to keep that alive, uh, as well as this fundamental question of, of where imagination sits, because hallucination is not necessarily imagination. And I guess there's a kind of way back door question that I don't know where that sits in this, but it's something I've had to be thinking a lot about or have been thinking a lot about right now, which is 
actually about agency and, and actually older questions of things like civil rights and what it means to actually enfranchise people politically. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, so there seems to be a radical distinction both in the fact that we're extremely critical of liberal condition traditions, and yet we also, there seems to be an argument that contemporary artificial intelligence, or at least um, in some of the work I track, one could argue that um, we're not even in a liberal age. It, it's extremely non predicated on ideas of the human that have any that are related to liberalism or the enlightenment like the idea of population based decision making through network systems um, is not right and i think that's your part about the contingency and sort of exclus exclusionary force of the computer but uh, a not of computing um, more broadly but you know for me there's there's sort of, sort of interesting and I guess this is where this is so, why your work is so provocative, Luciana, but I was also really um, glad to be introduced to your work, Rami, as in trying to understand, like, how do we think? I mean, do we want to think that, you know, of course, not all things should be commiserate and the same. So, you know, it might just be about you pressuring me every time I think I've gotten out of my little binary. <laughs> I, can, I, can, I cannot be forced to reimagine it. But, you know, fundamentally, like, how do we, can we, you know, what are you thinking about Luciana in terms of like, yeah, where do these questions of imagination come in? Where, where does the political, um, the political question come in? Because and um, and and also, how do we imagine then um, not necessarily homogenization and inclusion, but still certain forms of, I guess, enfranchisement in terms of ability to exercise political power. For which is you know for groups that are excluded, particularly in this case, we're talking about um, blacks, um, you know, by people who've been colonially ex um, oppressed and are kind of excluded from certain power structures or allocations of capital or, or the technology itself. Um, and we don't know if enfranchisement necessarily means any type of liberation, of course, but I, I guess this question of, of power comes into play um, here. And uh, so I don't know. So basic, basic thought, just talk to me a little bit, or maybe we can all talk together about like, yeah, where do things like imagination, narrativity, like producing um, new forms of meanings and futurity, uh, in relationship to both according these histories while at the same time not being techno-determinist or technophilic. Uh, how does that work maybe for you, Luciana, uh, if it does at all, of course. Um, and maybe Rami, I'd love to hear more too, just to have both of you in conversation about uh, maybe these practices. Thanks. I'll leave it at that. Right? Thanks, thanks, <laughs> thanks for being Thanks for these provocations. Hold hold the questions, um, Luciana, and uh, give Romy a chance to uh, to speak. Romy, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, I keep smiling because I'm kind of like excited and bursting with energy as I hear both of your responses. Um, but also, I think just want to start by offering a lot of gratitude to each of you um to Ab Abdu Malik Simone for the invitation for convening us today to Luciana for all of your work and generosity and also in sharing your article on Criti critical inquiry and then Albert for all of your or, or sorry for all of your um responses today kind of gratitude and then synthesizing some of our work to be put into conversation um and then also to thank each of you kind of individually for your work. It's informed a lot of my own trajectory. A lot of my past before this kind of current station in media arts was very much in urban design and digital cartography. Um, and I would say each of your work, um, Abdu, Malik, your work in people's infrastructure, Luciano, your work in contagious architectures, and Orit, a lot of your work on thinking about interface, Kevin Lynch, pattern and legibility has been really instrumental in some of these shifts. Um, and for the conversation today, I think I wanted to maybe highlight, Luciana, something you said in your uh, kind of recapping of, you know, these last kind of seven years of thought. 
um, with your emphasis on the medium itself. And I think pushing back against a kind of containment about the medium or automation or digital technologies, automated decision-making um, has already been settled, already being foreclosed. And I think pointing to uh, the kind of contours or the bounds of how critique still kind of replicates a kind of void in terms of how we think about the medium um, is already kind of being settled. And I share, I think, a lot of that sentiment too, um, particularly when it comes to terms like computation. Um, and I think trying to really disentangle computation from a kind of computationalism or from the like expansion of how everything can be rearticulated through axioms of, you know, uh, statistical modeling or a kind of, um, I don't know, dependence on uh, a kind of universalism, right, that can be then translated into something read or understood by a machine. Um, so just wanted to really highlight that uh, to then maybe introduce some of the other comments that I'd like to make, which maybe were a little bit more specific to the article that you shared in Critical, Critical Inquiry, but I think obviously touches on a lot of other things that are coming up in conversation. And so one of the things that I felt struck by in your article um, are kind of the very deft deployments of metaphors of light uh, within it. So both of how you're thinking about dark optics, non-photography and blackness, um, but then also there are a lot of metaphors around light, the enlightenment, what it means to have a kind of teleological end for a certain type of episteme. Um, and I like that you're dealing with blackness through these kind of like metaphorical lenses, uh, both within and kind of beyond the logics of race. Um, I think that comes up in a, in a lot of different ways. So you're talking about blackness as a kind of negation of an enlightenment episteme of knowledge, but also the ways that Blackness holds this very fraught position as a kind of para-ontological or kind of anti-ontological position um, as a kind of state before individuation. Um, and I that you can see that a lot in references to, um, like C. Riley Snorton writes about this as a kind of transness, as that moment before uh, the kind of incorporation into particular legible, legible forms. Um, but this also carries over into physics and information theory. Um, in some of my own work, I've been thinking a lot about the Black body literally as kind of the site where entropy happens, whether we're thinking about Maxwell's demon, these early thought experiments that, you know, come from studies of thermodynamics, Brownian motion, which is all very inspirational for Wiener's work in thinking about entropy and information theory. Um, so I just kind of tracking some of these ways in which Blackness shows up and these kind of overlapping, um, you know, ways of thinking that you both touch upon and that are also kind of held up by other thinkers. And I think I always kind of come back to Blackness within flesh, thinking again about medium, um, because I think it becomes an important reminder to still reinstill the maybe like material effects or um, I don't know, results that happen because of the kind of violence that we're speaking of and fleshed as this kind of violent removal, right, of a self-possession or corporeal um, understanding of the body. And obviously like Hortense Spillers is really instrumental in thinking through this, but I think Alex Wahelier bridges on um, a lot of Hortense Spillers work in some interesting ways and refocusing that kind of indeterminacy again that in a way uh, like maybe reveals the particularities and the closure around a kind of liberal humanist subject and that kind of containment and so the kind of indeterminacy of that flesh still born from certain forms of violence still poses a kind of threat to uh, the kind of interiority that you're speaking through through De Silva's work in your article um, and so one of the first questions that was kind of coming up in response um, is I guess I was curious how moving through these different registers of Blackness, uh, how that really shows up in your work and your thinking about Blackness, both uh, some of the metaphoric, non-philosophical, -philosoph non-photography, dark optics, but then in relationship, I guess, to these other kind of treatments of Blackness, both through information theory, but then also through the flesh within uh, kind of the Black radical tradition or kind of Black feminist understandings of Blackness and flesh. Um, and then how that also resonates with your focus and emphasis on medium in particular. Um, so I wanted to kind of offer that as a question for a conversation later. Um, and then I think another thing that was really becoming, 
I don't know, really productive for me um, and a lot of your thinking and a lot of your own uh, reflections on your thinking is this kind of necessity, I think, for exteriority. Um, often the necessity of exteriority as a kind of fix uh, within these kind of contradictory crises, um, I think within both philosophy and automation. Um, and I think Denise de Silva speaks to this really well in her conception of uh, Hegel's kind of transcendental poesis or the requirement for uh, the kind of interior thinking, knowing subject to encounter the exterior, to kind of engulf it uh, as a as a necessary step for the actualization of the spirit. Um, and so we can see the ways that interiority tries to, uh, you know, kind of circumvent its own limitations through the engulfing of exteriority. I think this also happens uh, in the various salient ways that you're kind of laying out a distinction between first and second order cybernetics and contagious architectures um, and kind of Godel's incompleteness theorem that there's this need to branch outside of the enclosed axiomatic symbolic language, language of comp computation um, and into these more second order uh, cybernetic realms where, as you're saying, contingency, uncertainty, the unknown gets kind of absorbed. Um, and so in thinking about exteriority a little bit more, uh, and I'm still kind of like wrestling with how you're talking about non-philosophy. I was kind of curious um, if non-philosophy is attempting to kind of negate the violences, the recursive re reproduction of certain forms of violent epistemes um, that exteriority has maybe held the space of symbolizing for so long. I'm curious of how you're thinking about exteriority through uh, this kind of lens of non-philosophy, like what is really the relationship between the two? Um, and then maybe what other like forms of thought are also trying to generate thinking from a place of exteriority, but maybe on different terms. So I was thinking about Glissant's use of relation or totality as maybe one of these kinds of examples. Um, that isn't just about maybe the negation of violence, but what's also the kind of uh, like life matter material medium of exteriority, uh, kind of beyond some of the prescriptions of like death or the threat to the interior knowing subject. So those are some thoughts that were kind of coming up. Um, and then lastly, and maybe this is like a bridge from kind of Luciana where you left off and then or at your uh, like very generous questions about synthesizing some of my work around the future conditional and some of Luciana's um, was thinking a lot about how you're troubling recursivity um, and maybe it's distinctions between repetition and modulation. Um, so for me, James Sneed's work and George Lewis have been really interesting in how I'm thinking about repetition, uh, not always in the like isomorphic continuation of something, but I think uh, as a kind of social, cultural, like maybe onto epistemology that is about a relationship, I think, to uncertainty, uh, accident, or risk, um, that is very much about a kind of embodied practice or embodied cultural practice or ritual practice. And so, um, and Kara Keeling, I think, writes about this really well and uh, queer times black futures and how she's thinking about modulation um, or social formations that thrive within a kind of uncertainty or what she calls queer temporality. Um, so I think in how I'm working through, you know, this piece that has been evolving and maybe is like unraveling at this point uh, called the future conditional, I think it's trying to take up some of these um, maybe like repertoires for how social cultural encodings of meaning, whether that's like through textiles or through oral traditions, um, are not recursive in the sense that they're trying to replicate themselves is still appearing to be coherent or unchanging by absorbing indeterminacy and then uh, maybe like taming it or kind of uh, making it seem uh, like rational or productive for its own means and a kind of instrumentality. But uh, that I'm trying to investigate this relationship between textiles, pattern making, and various oral traditions because of their kind of embrace of a kind of uncertainty, and then uh, what that what that means in terms of a kind of speculative form for how information is enclosed. And so I've been making these, you know, uh, soft circuit kind of quilts that 
house particular, um, you know, excerpts from conversations and interviews that I've been doing with different thinkers and artists. Um, and so it, when I'm evoking the future conditional, I think it's very much in that sense. And again, this is taken from a lot of Tina Camp's work and listening to images. Um, but I think what's important here is again, this kind of distinction between recursivity or kind of an autopoiesis that's informed by recursivity that is about a self-generation within a kind of reproduction um, that's absorbing uncertainty, but absorbing uncertainty to maintain itself as seeming coherent. Um, but rather the kind of embracing of uncertainty that uh, then requires like the form to shift or to change. Um, and I think what I really appreciate about like movie repertoire as a way to talk about this is that it requires uh, like a continual coming together to kind of like then reanalyze the terms, reanalyze the form. And so it's the space where I think epistemology gets kind of remade and remade um, and then uh, maybe like constituted through these physical forms. So when I'm thinking about the future conditional, it's kind of from that approach. And I think there's a parallel maybe with the ways, Luciana, that you're thinking about the medium of automation, um, not so much in like a recursive reproduction, but, uh, you know, the ways that you're kind of thinking about alien thought, or I know that Beth Coleman right now is writing a lot about uh, like rewilding and what it would mean to rewild AI in these kind of ways. Um, so maybe that's where I'll like leave my comments for now. So we have enough time to converse amongst the four of us. Um, but just wanted to, yeah, again, thank you all three for all of your contributions and the ways that you've informed how I think and practice. Oh, just a quick thing. I um, Thanks, Rami. I just wanted to highlight that uh, I, I didn't know how this was going, but I did highlight one moment in your article, Luciana, on page 314, where it says, as it may become clear later, if decision making is already given in the world as a natural evolution of, of human reason, is because its structure is sustained by the flesh of the medium. And, and like Rami, I was really interested in your in your relationship to flesh on to surface and, and just maybe elaborating a bit more about that. And then, yeah, I, and then um, this question about repertoire versus uh, recursivity, like the different forms of uncertainty we might imagine in an, in, a, in an age where it seems like uncertainty is almost being automated. Uh, if we think about the way volatility is so central to like disaster capitalism or what have you. Um, so uh, the, just wanted to jump in there to say, those are totally things that um, I was thinking about too. And thank you, Rami. Yeah, thank you, Rami, for all of this. Um, so there's enough there's enough stuff on the table, Luciana, for another seven years worth of uh, of, of of work. But yeah, it's, the floor is yours to address some of these really interesting provocations. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, guys. I mean, I'm uh, super fat. It's like Ryan was saying, I'm I'm thrilled and excited <laughs> about all this uh, this talk coming through, and um, you know. Um, just importantly to uh, clarify, but also to show some problems, right? There are some problems here that we have, you know, that, um, that I think are un, un cooking beneath uh, what I'm uh, articulating. And I think um, I am interested in uh, discussing uh, from already this uh, uh, comment on hallucination is not imagination. Um, so what is the, the tension between hallucination and imagination? I'm interested in uh, uh, rethinking about, um, you know, how does uh, blackness not uh, stay as a metaphor or as another some kind of sublimation or where the outside lies? Because we know that the sublimation is exactly what has fueled, uh, you know, the, the structure of uh, uh, epistemological of determination. Uh, the the model of self of uh, self uh, of determination of the subject that uh, the Silva talks about uh, racial capitalism you know the the kind of extraction of uh, externality is exactly uh, key and and you know in a way if one uh, like when Silvia Winter talks about blackness the refugee the immigrant you know there's this kind of endless uh, kind of um, um, 
uh, externalities that become uh, uh, part of the, the uh, model of incorporation of capital, then uh, if we just sublimate this externality as something that is never captured or ineffable or absolute contingency, we are in the same problem, I think. We are in the same problem uh, that you know sets up the premises of the capture. So how, how do you talk about externality or the outside um by uh, without side skipping or pretend to side skip actually uh the problem of capture and and i think that automated system do bring this problem to the fore because you know you can um you know even when you think about predict predictability when you think about computational predictability and the importance of the incomputable for this kind of um, large language model uh you know, the entropy randomness has not to do with something that is uh, uh, to be warned off or to be just incorporated, but learned from. You know, just is a clear way in which extraction um, uh, becomes um, a value. You know, the extraction of, of externality or something that cannot be compressed into a cognitive, you know, uh, schema is a value, right? So in that in the term is a value. And and in a way, what black the black radical from uh, tradition uh tells us is that in the term is, it's always been a value. This is not new, right? So there is this kind of uh interesting clash that uh people you know um uh, or the scholarship or debate about uh, uh technology uh things about systems of power um within uh the European model of critique. And 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 I think that interestingly, this model of critique that you also find in uh, uh Anna Harent uh you know gets broken when uh, um the model of servo mechanic that is so clear clearly key to uh, technology is broke is is you know just put that on the plate. It's laid bare. What do you do? Where does the instrumentality comes from? What is it? How how can we define um, this tool without understanding the kind of uh, metaphysical conception of this tool that is key to the formation of the interior exterior diet of racial capitalism? And and so that for me is the is the question I'm uh, wrestling with. And I found in this question of you know that one can argue is the work of Afro pessimism, or one can argue is the work of Fred M uh, Morton, uh, is this kind of um, insistence on the on the, on the negative negation. So what what it means is that you're not it's not just the negative of being or the negative of the inside. It's also the negation, and that's where the politics is is constantly negated, right? So when you talk about enfranchising, the enfranchisement uh, comes with the cost of being negating the possibility of being because no one enters the possibility of being except one model that is this um, recursively reproducing itself which means is uh, differentially reproducing itself. It's like those kind of, I don't know if you've seen this uh, uh, generative AI model of faces uh, or the person doesn't exist. This is website, the person who doesn't exist. The person doesn't exist, they have thousands of faces. And it always reminds me of Deleuze and Gattari, a question of the regime of faciality, right? That the regime of faciality is infinitely variable, but it's always the face. <laughs> Right and and uh, and so it's very um, you know so the enfranchising comes with the cost of the of, of of negation and negation is where the violence is all the time it's where is exactly the fuel of this uh, spectacular mode of power where the more dead the body the more like you know if we have to say with Sadia Hartman the scene of subjection is the fuel of the structure of, of oppression. So, uh, you know, how do you break the spectacle? Um, and and I think this is uh, super interesting to hear, Rami, your work of um, uh, this kind of the form, that you are interested in the form, because that's exactly what um, I think is missing, because uh, what is missing is the other, you know, the... Um, uh, the, the 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 capacity of critique of uh, 
um, uh, coming up with the form, with the with something formal, a conceptual abstract, uh, um, uh, also let's say ge generic in in the sense of Laruel, which I'll explain in a, in a second, without rather being you know caught in this universal particular. You know, the universal particular. We say on one end there is the conception, that there is the practice. Right, the particular practice or the particular or the application of it. So how you instead bring, uh, you said that the form for you is this continual coming together to reanalyze the That I go back to non philosophy for a second, and what uh, Laruel gives me is not just a, an anti philosophy or a, uh, a, a non philosophy, it's actually trying to break open the pillars of philosophical decision as a given, it is self post, right? And, and, and instead, it, it starts from the real, the real that is the, the place where you know, things are not already cognized but have meanings or they cannot be cognized by thought to start with or a priori, but they have meaning. And actually the meaning of the real is this capacity of cloning, clone itself, it says it clones itself onto thought, which is not just a photographic, uh, like classic realism image of the real, but actually it can only uh, clone itself in the last scenes as, as and when it happens. So there is a sense of temporality that is, one time each time is absolutely singular. It's unreproducible. He says um, the, in the last instance of philosophy, non-philosophy kind of determines itself in the last instance as a when one time each time the real enters to uh, you know to to shock thought one can say or what um, you know it doesn't it it does not know and what has to be. Um, constantly revised or constructed again. And it is in this kind of process of construction or revision of jump start that the politics happens. And I think it happens all the time. And I love the work uh, of Fred Mott when he talks about, you know, from jazz to the barbecue to, you know, to all the work that I'm gonna go to the techno flesh in a second. Or R.D. Judy, when he talks about, you know, forms of uh, practices or refusal if, that have always existed. So the point is not that we have to make up a new world <laughs> of political. The point is that of really looking into the politics that are always there. The abolitionary politics are millions, thousands, <laughs> infinite numbers. Is that uh, the structure of um, critique? Uh, and of uh, idea of the future of the people to come, the messianic model of critique is still blocks us from uh, accounting from the millions of practice that happen, that they've been happening every day, right? So um, it's not just uh, uh, so. So what is where is the repression? The repression is in the telling of the story. I think that Winter is right. Um, the 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 mythopoiesis, the the story has been told in one way only and keeps on being reproduced. That is the stuckness of critique as opposed to the, mo the forms and the practices of politics and forms of politics because they were forms. And I want to insist on this point because I want to argue to the fact that um, practice, are not, the know-how is not just something you do. It's something that forces thinking, that transforms uh, you know, cognition that uh, challenges pillars is uh, is something that has to have some kind of radical no going back kind of thing. <laughs> you know, some kind of irreversibility um, uh, of the system uh, that uh, you know can reboot itself but cannot rewrite itself as a whole, and that's what is interesting. So, in this project of um, a technology of abolition that I'm looking at, that I'm starting with uh, the CCB, is exactly to, to um, unpack, it's not just an archive, because in a way, you can't reproduce the archive. And again, I, I want to go back to 
Sadia Atman wayward lives. You know, you cannot reproduce the archive. You can't come up with this pristine, oh, look what has been hidden, uh, this pristine data. But you, 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 your critique is to uh, also to speculate, fabulate, push, uh, which is what one can do with computation, right? It needs to be pushed away from the, uh, the the model of application that we have it, and I hear you, um, uh, Orit, when you say, you know, what 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 are what can we, do? you know, what are the what are these instances, right? And and I think that uh, there are various level of instances of politics, and I I don't think that to look at if Rami is interested in looking at the quilt and the patterning and the social technical structure of the patterning where the indeterminacy is there to be embraced, uh, which you could say, well, also capitalism embraced that indeterminacy, but capitalists can only capture what is needed for value. And the value is a monopolistic, clear value, right? And it's not other values. It's not social values, it's not convivial value. It's not, you know, uh, heretic value. It's, it's, you know, so that's also important to what is the, what values are we talking about? Right. And and for me, it's also important. That's my my work, because I, I have this a little bit of a nerd in me that wants to look at the kind of uh, infrastructure of these uh, larger systems, machine learning. I want to look into the technique and I want to see where they are speaking, the, the indeterminacy, um, because I, I don't want to read the papers of Google X and, um, um, you know, Elon Musk research group and just take them as granted. They are not telling me the truth. I mean, they can tell me how it works, how it functions, but they, they are not holding the dominion over computation. I want to take that down. I want to take the dominion of computation away from them. And, and you know, and, even, and it's a bit like sci the scientists will always say, oh, you don't know nothing. You're not a scientist. Well, you know, try me. <laughs> let's all study uh, that and let's see who, you know, it, it's this kind of disciplinary of, um, division of the humanities that instead says, oh, the humanities is completely scared because we have this church BT that we have coding that we have, you know, what about the Greeks? <laughs> the Greeks. <laughs> okay, fine. Let's, let's think, you know, it's this lateral thinking that uh, it's a bit like this setting up that I was doing this course in this uh, paper automation and philosophy they are science and humanities are locked into this kind of structures of value that we have to reproduce or challenge but we can't create others right and and so that's what the politics uh, for me is um in in this work but um this is one level you know there are as i say this there are so many levels uh, and I, I don't think we should foreclose uh, neither or uh, uh, none of them but um i do agree already that you know uh in a way uh instead of a neoliberal model of the human there is definitely a neoliberal model of indeterminacy i i totally agree with you yeah so i don't know if that answers some of these questions there were also some other i don't know if there's an answer you know and usually well, no, the question ah the techno flesh the techno flesh <laughs> yeah techno -flesh, but, the uh, materiality i think that's also super important because if if i'm arguing that the techno flesh is this kind of social technical structure then the social technical structure of the servo mechanic is the stealing of the flesh and the and the production of the body um, and I very inspired, I don't know if you know the book, uh, Sentient Flesh by Ardi Judy. And he has an old session on techno flesh. Uh, I mean, it's a little different for you work with Aristotle. I have a problem with Aristotle. <laughs> That's another thing. But it's very interesting, you know, that he, he actually talks about uh, know how practices of dancing or speaking in tongue or, you know, or, or, or fugitive practices that um, he maps into this kind of um, uh, forms, forms, not, you know, of knowledges that have, you know, uh, that have coexisted the plantation or even when uh, Sylvia Winter talks about the plot at the plantation, you know, she has, she has this wonderful article about what you are allowed to plot that is nothing eatable 
nothing uh, digestible and it's this um a bit like uh, you know the octavia battle uh, imaginary of of uh, of the alien um a sub model of subsistence right that it's not it's exterior because it it doesn't feed on anything that is organically good and and that's problematic because you can say well you can see in america so i'm living in us i guess it's a totally different world from uk where uh, you know i've been looking at these structures of power and tension and and i'm italian and i'm familiar with the mediterranean as well but you know, as other forms of uh, uh, oppression, uh, uh, anti-migration, anti-refugee, you know, the level of visceral patriarchy and violence on women every day. But um, is the is the, uh, the American infrastructure of articulation of power? I mean, you can only I understand uh much better where the afro pessimist uh and the, the importance of maintaining um the negation of ontology comes from i i it's just interestingly uh palpable in the everyday and that and that's a politics as well uh so all these things are cooking other other you know like but um, the techno fetch is important exactly for this. Uh, um, on one end, violence, but also one end, on the other hand, this kind of transness of, of the flesh. Um, you know, because uh, not just for its plasticity or a morphology, which is again falls back into what um, you know Zakia Jackson also in her critique of uh, Malabu plasticity is again what is demanded of this non-being right uh, of becoming uh producing and becoming uh, uh in the in the sphere of exchange value and property but actually how the the, the transness of uh, uh, elaborating forms i am interested this in this question of the form of creating a form of uh, a shifting critique, not just towards the the, the crisis of, of of theory, the crisis of form, the crisis of 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 concepts of reason, but really rethink those pillars. Um, so it's uh, which it sounds very modern, right? But maybe it's of a modernity where a lot of stuff happened, and we're still dealing with it. Um, so I don't know that I'm I am curious to hear your comments on that. So, I don't know. No, mostly I think I mean I'm I'm pretty much with you. Uh, you know, I, just thinking with you uh, uh, further. Um, I think one of the things that's really interesting to me is this question of value and economy and how we produce different forms of value. Um, I think I I a little bit can't give away from. Um, on one, on, well, I, I go in between them just as a matter of, of kind of practice. Uh, I have always, you know, as someone who is not an artist, but loves the arts and uh, also has thought a lot with performance studies and, and these questions, the repertoire and the archive and um, have always, and with feminism and also with critical race theory around time, um, you know, I've always kind of rested on kind of thinking about these micro practices and embodied practice as, as of course, always sites of ongoing power. That, that power is always, you know, in a Foucauldian, not, not top down. Well, it is also top down. <laughs> um, so, I mean, there's also then sometimes just realities of oligarchy and extraction and like, um, and I, and I, and, and so I, you know, I, I think that that's true and that it opens us to thinking about a lot of different tactics. I have, however, uh, I guess lately been thinking a lot about scale and, and yeah, there is always this problem of, of incorporation and externality and what happens when you're incorporating or kind of assimilated into a system. But there is also this question that maybe in that process systems change somehow, maybe their sites of value change, maybe what they're extracting changes, maybe it's not always already the same. Um, and I think that's some of the promise that um, I think you've already talked about in terms of um, Sylvia Winter and so many people's work on kind of um, 
the place blackness has in producing this kind of indecidability or, or, or kind of breaking with determinism. But at the same time, just pragmatically, I'm sometimes thinking, you know, um, on one hand, I, I kind of always, uh, you know, I'm, I'm there with Anna Singh, but on the other hand, is that what we're always going to do? Just kind of crouch in the ruins of capital and like scrounge and, and make lives, of course. Are there other things? And I guess, Abdul Malik, you, you might step in here about the, the people to come and the, and the city that is yet to come. Um, you know, that there are potentialities at scale also. Um, even if that does mean, of course, producing new forms of power and, and, and consolidation and, and, and identities and stuff like that. Uh, so I think mostly, um, yeah, I just found that very generative. You're, you're incredibly um, articulate and passionate and it pushes back obviously on a lot of the questions I'm having right now, mostly dealing with financialization um, and things like decentralized finance and, and things like that. Uh, and also with infrastructure, which is, you know, um, you know, when you're thinking mm -hmm. about uh, infrastructures of energy and infrastructures of uh, computing. Um, and I hear you, you know, so basically I'm just kind of percolating, but I, I you know, I'm, I, I'm enjoying thinking with you further about these these questions and also about like, where are we pushing? Where do we want to push winter? Uh, where do we want to push the thinking about the plot? Um, uh, you know, um, which is, is kind of a grounding essay uh, that I'm constantly teaching and going through about thinking about how we, how people resist the logic of plantation extractionism, but at the same time, we're like, what, you know, what, what do plots look like today? And what would, uh, um, you know, what are, what other forms of, of, of life and governance can, can we bring into being? Um, what do we need to do? But I don't have any answers. So I just found this. Thank you for your beautiful answer. Thanks. Thanks, Orit. Uh, before we move to a new ceremony in a couple of minutes, um, I'll give Rami the last word, the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm like, I'm stuck on scale right now. I think I'm going to stay stuck on scale for a little bit. I'm always stuck um, on scale, and I never know yeah. what to do with it, but I like throwing it out. It's that know? like real troublesome, <laughs> unavoidable thing that always has to be spoken to, you, but you have to kind of fight not to absorb the logics of it, but there's a real pragmatism to it that needs to be addressed. Um, and I guess in hearing you speak, so how do I say this? Um, I think I want to maybe like highlight, Luciana, the ways that you're talking about speculation um, and the importance of speculation maybe in some of this work. Um, and I think for me that speculation tends to veer more backwards than it does forwards. And so in thinking about, again, this problem of scale, the ways that I maybe romanticize repertoire, admittedly, um, like oh, some of the too. examples... Yeah. Um, some of the examples that I'm still sitting with and haven't I have no clear conclusions about, but that I think are provocative for thinking about, I don't know, how sticky scale can be um, and like what are the kind of places or instantiations that we kind of look to in terms of this uh, like non-recursive, -recur non-reproducible, uh, like maybe auto-poetic turn and like Winter's like distinction. Um, one of the things that I'm stuck on, uh, I guess, is the Negro Motorist Green Book in this kind of way of thinking about scale, thinking about repertoire, thinking about the like uh, social technical infrastructures around information and information sharing that are not just about an instrumentalization, but that is also about a kind of conviviality. Um, and I guess like a super short synopsis for people that may be unfamiliar, um, but this was kind of circulated um, from, I believe the earliest publication was 1934 to about 1965, uh, but circulated as a guidebook, quote unquote guidebook, uh, for Black travelers in the U.S. kind of coincides with like the, 
I don't know, post-war economies and the availability of the automobile in different ways for, for Black people, um, but listed uh, city by city and state by state different um, kind of accommodations that Black people could access as they're traversing the kind of like overly racist landscape of Jim Crow America. That's an oversimplification, but this is like a quick synopsis of what it was. But one of the things that's super interesting to me is that Victor H. Green and Alma Green, who are the people that kind of created this, um, had deep ties to the Postal Workers Union. And so a lot of the information was sourced from postal workers kind of walking their routes, uh, like interacting with people in the neighborhood, either that were business owners or that would open up their own homes as tourist homes. And then this information would circulate back into a guidebook that was printed. Um, but in terms of scale, I think it it works in this kind of meso scale where there are a lot of like micro interactions that are happening, but then it does also operate at this much larger um, I don't know, kind of application to the point where like uh, as like standard oils, like SO filling stations are like, you know, circulating this guidebook it, because the <laughs> overt racism of Jim Crow was so legible within a kind of like juridic architecture of the U.S. at the time, like having uh, like a black travel guide was not a uh, like pejorative thing, right? It was like innocuous, it was like a necessity in this way. Um, and I think there's a way to read the green book as a kind of like, you know, a normative response that has like a very pragmatic goal. I think there's another reading um, where it operates in this kind of like discrete infinity in a way. Um, Luciana, I like the way that you bring up Gregory H. Hayden's work in, uh, in Contagious Architectures and his concept of Omega about this kind of discrete, discrete infinity, right? The like kind of incomputable thing that it maybe exists in this uh, like spatial or temporal range, but it still can't quite be uh, like captured completely uh, in his work on compression. And I think when I'm trying to wrestle with, again, the like non-reproducing recursivity or wrestle with these notions of scale, um, I think about certain types of Black spatial practices in this kind of discrete infinity. So if the guidebook is a discrete object with a pragmatic aim uh, that involves people meeting other people, information circulates, also has these like very kind of like infinite trajectories that expand far outside of like the form and the medium of what the book is because the book is just like a minute reflection a reduction of a much larger like social technical infrastructure that can't quite be contained um and uh i think like Thulani davis just wrote this book uh, circuits of emancipation that is kind of charting not explicitly the green book but i think there's a strong overlap and the social kind of like technical infrastructures that she's mapping at a similar time that you would have to think of as being necessitated by some of the work that the Green Book does. So um, I think in like closing the things that like are sticking out for me and that are still, you know, very much unresolved, but in terms of like speculation and what it means for my work, these questions of scale, um, these are kind of the things that are sitting at the forefront of my mind. Uh, the ways that this kind of discrete infinity doesn't collapse into being wholly and absolutely unknowable or absolutely axiomatic, clear, and legible, but uh, is able to, you know, have a kind of surface tension to appear one way, but then to kind of operate um, beyond the means of, of what would be considered. And so when I'm thinking about uh, like legibility and pattern, these are some of the things that I like to disrupt a little bit. Um, and I'm always looking for these kind of yeah, like omega moments or practices that uh, create these collisions between scale, pragmatism, but also like really foreground, I think, the reduction that can happen uh, through compression, where, you know, what is visible is really just like a small, uh, like condensed version of what's also kind of operating, uh, like subterraneously or uh, kind of beyond the medium itself. So that's, that's maybe what I'll close with and offer. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, thank Luciana. You thank, thank you, thank you so you. much. <laughs> yeah. And um, let's come back a year from now and um, see what everyone is thinking and has to say to each other. But uh, I wish you all well in, in your work. And once again, thank you for taking the time for such an amazing conversation.